Hello, I'm working on 3D printed rover and it has a lot of motors. Motors are used to drive the wheels and also for wheel steering. And each one of them should be controlled with a precision. So using a servo motor is an obvious choice here. But I'm not very happy with the regular hobby servo motors like this one. They have several issues that I don't like. First of all, they are usually not 360 degrees and continuous rotation is also not supported, which makes them impossible to use for driving the wheels. The second issue is communication interface. The update rate is quite slow and it's also not possible to read data back from the servo motor. For example, you cannot acquire the current position or rotation speed of the servo motor. And the third problem is that they are not very flexible. So I decided to create my own servo motor controller board that could be easily installed in various parts of the rover. That gives me a lot of flexibility. I can use it with different types of DC motors. And the servo motor is not a standalone device anymore. It becomes a part of the wheel. Let's first take apart this small servo motor and see how it works. You can see here a small electric motor. This light green plastic part is a variable resistor used as a position sensor. Everything is mounted on the control board. This control board uses a PWM input signal to set up the required position, the so-called set point. Then it constantly reads the sensor's current position and calculates the motor's required direction and power. And finally, the electric motor rotates the servo motor's output shaft and the sensor. This is called a closed loop control system. It's designed to automatically achieve and maintain the desired output position by comparing it with the actual position. There is a great variety of how a servo motor could be implemented. Various types of motors, sensors and control algorithms could be used. The regular hobby servo motor uses a brush DC motor, a variable resistor as a position sensor, and the communication interface is a PWM signal. The control system is made with a specialized analog chip that combines both logic and the motor driver. My servo motor is made differently. I am using brushed DC motor too, but my sensor of choice is a magnetic encoder. It's a small chip that can sense the orientation of the magnetic field near it. To use it, you need to take a small disk magnet with proper field orientation and attach it to the motor shaft. Then you need to place the magnetic encoder close to the magnet. Now you can read the magnet's orientation from the chip using SPI interface. This encoder holds the central spot on the board for easier alignment with the rotation axis. And of course, the servo motor is digital, so I am using STM32G0 microcontroller to run the control algorithm. This microcontroller is cheap and small, but quite capable and has great peripherals. However, most microcontrollers are not designed to handle the high current required for the motor. So we also need to add a motor driver to fix that. This driver provides up to 12 volts and 2 amps for the motor. This circuitry here is a current sensor. Initially, I added it for safety measures only. But lately, I realized that with this current sensor, I can build a far more advanced control system. We will get to this later. For now, just keep in mind that we have this additional sensor here. The last important change is the communication interface. Instead of a simple PWM signal, I'm using the I2C interface here. It's a widely used interface that allows two-way communication. So now I can also read the current state, position, rotation speed and other data from the servo motor. The other benefit is that now we can transmit not only the set point, but also several configuration parameters 
that affect control algorithm operation and let us fine-tune the servo motor. And the last important feature of I2C is that this interface supports addressing. So, since I'm going to have a lot of servo motors in the rover, I can stack several servo motors on the same bus instead of routing a separate interface to each one of them. For example, here I can just split a cable and connect two servo motors to it, and each could be independently operated. This makes systems with many servo motors simple and scalable. Now I hope you understand the hardware. And before starting on the control algorithm, I will quickly explain what a PWM signal is. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation, and it's a type of electric signal that consists of pulses of a constant frequency. Here is what a graph of voltage versus time looks like. The frequency of the PWM signal corresponds to one period duration T. During this period we have a portion with a full voltage applied and the rest is zero voltage. And if our full voltage portion has a duration T on, we can calculate the most important characteristic of the PWM signal, called the duty cycle. It's equal to T on divided by T. In simple words, the duty cycle is a percentage of the full voltage portion during one period. The duty cycle can vary, that's the main feature of the PWM signal. The PWM signal could be used for data transfer. We can encode some data to a duty cycle value and transmit it with the PWM signal. That's exactly what regular hobby servo motors use to change the set point. In the case of data transfer, the current flowing is usually very small. But PWM could also be used to regulate power delivery. For example, applying a PWM signal to a heater element will make the heater's power proportional to the duty cycle. It's a widely used way to regulate the power of heaters, motors and other devices. In this case, because we deliver the power with the PWM signal, the current could be very high. In fact, in many cases these two different types of PWM signals goes together. In my servo motor the high current signal is provided by the motor driver, while the driver is controlled by a low current signal from the microcontroller. Now I will explain how the control system works. I will try to keep it simple. The overall goal of the control algorithm is to calculate the direction and the duty cycle for the motor. This goal is achieved by a three-layer system. The first layer is the position control. This layer's inputs are the set point and the current position from the sensor. The output is the desired motor's velocity, and we feed this output to the next layer, which is the velocity control. So, the first layer is constantly trying to achieve the desired position by changing the motor's velocity. The second layer is the velocity control. This layer also needs the current velocity as an input. We don't have a sensor to measure velocity directly, but we can build a velocity estimator that derives velocity from a sequence of position readings. Different techniques could be used here, but I used probably the simplest one, a derivative with a moving average filter. Theoretically, we can just output the PWM duty cycle from this layer, but controlling the motor speed with the duty cycle is not ideal. So we can do better than this and output the desired motor current instead. In electric motors, the current is proportional to torque and controlling velocity with torque makes perfect sense. And because we have a current sensor, we can build third and final layer, which is the current control. The current control layer uses readings from the current sensor and constantly tries to adjust the PWM duty cycle to achieve the desired current. The duty cycle from this layer then goes to a driver, which amplifies this signal and drives the motor. 
And since the motor is connected to sensors, we close the control loop. This current control layer could be represented as a completely separate closed loop system. This part of the system runs at a frequency of about 15 kHz, while the first two layers run at 4 kHz. The reason is that current control does not depend on any physical movements and response happens very quickly, while the first two layers depend on the motor inertia and react much slower. Another benefit of the current control is that we can easily add a current limiter to the algorithm. The current limiter can prevent high currents that may occur during motor start-up or stall. Each layer of the control system is a variation of PID controller, and in total I have about 10 parameters that define the control system behavior. As with any PID-like control system, these parameters require proper tuning. I didn't use any special techniques for tuning, just good old trial and error. This system is quite easy to tune. I was able to get decent results quickly. Here you can see how the motor reacts to set point changing in steps. To give you an idea of bad tuning, in this example we have overshooting. And here it oscillates around the set point. This is the final result when the set point moves smoothly for even better acceleration control. Now I will show you how I integrated these boards into my rover wheel design. Let's take apart the wheel steering mechanism first. The wheel is attached to this big gear, and you can see a small disc magnet here. The servo motor controller board is attached to the top part, and when we assemble everything, the magnet is placed right next to the magnetic encoder on the board. The electric motor here is a well-known N20 motor, 12 volts, 60 rpm. Not fast, but has decent torque. You can also see that this assembly has an integrated ball bearing. This bearing is quite important, because the full load of this wheel gets transferred through this one. There is another bearing on the bottom to stabilize the axis, but it's hard to show it to you, so take a look at the animation instead. These bearings are nothing more than steel balls and 3D printed parts. I learned how to design these bearings and now I place them everywhere in the rover. Let me know if you want to learn how to design and print them. I can share my experience. Now let's put it together and after some tuning the steering mechanism is done. Another integration example is the wheel itself. It shares the same idea. A magnet is attached to the gear. A servo motor board is placed near the magnet when everything is assembled. And two big nice bearings to carry the load. By the way, the tire is flexible and it's 3D printed too with a material called TPU. Maybe it seems like a lot of parts but the design is quite simple. The only thing that I don't like about it is that it's very hard to assemble. The biggest issue is that the wire goes through all parts and is soldered on both ends. So now I cannot even take it apart to properly show all parts to you, because I don't want to redo the soldering. However, I learned the lesson and will try to put more thoughts into the assembly process in my future designs. The last demonstration is how both motors work at the same time. 
I hope you like this video. Let me know if you are interested in using these servo motor boards for your builds. Subscribe for more videos about the rover and other projects. Have a great day!